seven. We just met um, for a little while in executive session, so <clears throat> thank you all for, for coming. Um, before I get started tonight, uh, I just wanted to um, ask, your, ask for your indulgence here on a brief uh, moment of silence for um, the Commonwealth's late governor, Paul Salucci, who was uh, with a memorial uh, uh, to him today in the State House. And I'd like to just ask for a moment of silence for Governor Salucci. Thank you. Um, to go over uh, the agenda tonight, we'll have uh, public participation. We'll have an update on school safety from our superintendent. We'll have a presentation on district determined measures and common core alignment from uh, our assistant superintendent and department heads. Uh, approval of the school calendar for next year, the approval of the uh, job description. Uh, vote to approve our district goals for next year. The superintendent's report, update on our Thompson rebuild project. Monthly financial report, subcommittee reports. Our consent agenda, followed by a secretary's report. And uh, if necessary, and I believe it may well be, uh, motion, uh, entertain a motion to enter executive session once again. Um, <clears throat> so, not sure, I didn't see the list. Is there any public participation? Currently? Chat of the year. No? None? Okay. We'll uh, move on to uh, update on school safety. Dr. Bodie. Uh, there was a request to just have an end of the year report on how we've been doing with um, securing the buildings. Though I will say the school safety and security also extends to um, the types of practice and drills that we do so that students and staff are both ready in the case of an emergency. And I will say with this, that particular issue, um, we have met all of our goals with respect to fire drills and lockdown procedures at every school. And um, uh, Ellen Digby, who is the person in the district who is responsible for making sure that all happens and, and, and making sure that every school uh, meets those requirements, um, has assured me that that has happened this year. With respect to the buildings w being locked and secured, the Let's talk about each level. At the elementary school, I believe that, and, and I'm very confident, that we have very secure schools. One of the things that we, uh, we added to our protocols this year um, was making sure that when teachers and students left the building for recess, that the door behind them locked. And, they, and for a while there, we were in some buildings, they had to go around to the front door and buzz in, but that be became pretty um, inconvenient. So we did re-lock, uh, re put new locks into those doors, and we have a s secure key system where teachers are able to exit and enter um, through a locked door that always remains locked. At the middle school, the same, though they don't go out for recess. Um, but you cannot get into the building unless you are buzzed in. And that even happens for the gym classes as well that go out and play on the field. So the security there is, I think, is very tight. I, I know that one parent mentioned that another, someone held the door open for them and they were able to enter and not without identifying themselves. And, uh, you know, I think as our consciousness about security grows, um, there'll be less of that, and th that's sort of hard as a school system to entirely um, make sure it doesn't happen, though um, we have been trying to change the culture around that as well as we go forward. So I know the building principals have uh, addressed that in different ways in their own schools. Our, our challenge still remains the high school, and I get a range of complaints. Frankly, more of the complaints is nobody can get in when they want to get in and, you know, and making sure that everybody's on board as to when the doors need to be open for community ed or for school committees or any other kinds of meetings. Um, but one of the challenges we have is that, you know, our, our 
support staff has decreased over the years due to budget reductions. And we really only have two people in the, in the office and both are very busy. You imagine a high school this size that one person is managing really uh, the, the phones and the buzzers most of the time. What we really need to have, and this won't solve all of our problems, but it certainly will go a long way to, to improving the situation, is to have someone that sits at that front desk in the foyer throughout the day, has the ability to do the buzzing in, check people, making sure that they sign in, that they have badges, they, we know where they're going in the building, they, to the extent possible, notify the people in the building that they're coming. Um, particularly now that we have central registration mm -hmm. in the high school, um, there have been some issues with that even in the last couple of weeks. So th my recommendation, uh, at least going forward for next year, is that we do have someone in that role. Um, we did not include that as an additive position when we were discussing the budget, but um, my so I'm asking that we that you make a motion to that we could add that position and where I would find the money to pay for it would be out of the international revolving account. Um, and then next year we'll look at how it becomes part of the base budget going forward. But I do think that would be important. And uh, the other piece is that we are looking to put a proposal together uh, this summer for capital looking at um, providing more cameras um, and secure doors, um, primarily at the high school, but certainly at Audison and the elementaries as well. And once we have that proposal together, we will share it with you, and that will be ready for capital. Uh, usually their deadline is sometime in August. Is that that's right? Um, so that that's an update. So the, propo the proposal I have is that you uh, vote to or make a motion to uh, authorize me to hire someone for that position, it would be at a TA salary. Okay. Kim, please. Um, so moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? <coughs> Aye. 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 All those against? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> any questions for Dr. Bodie on this issue? Okay. Moving on. Um, district determined measures, common core alignment. I see a lot of uh, department heads here with us tonight. Thank you and, and good evening. Yes. Kim. We should introduce everyone, yes. um, and, I pre and I really appreciate them coming this evening because they're, it's a busy, busy time of the year, as they all know. Um, these represent our, our five core department chairs. We have Deb Perry, who is our K-12 um, English Language Arts Department Chair, Matt Coleman, Mathematics, Larry Weathers, Science, Carrie Dunn, Social Studies History, and Catherine Ritz, World Languages. So I'll turn this over to, to Laura. We're actually going to start with the um, presentation on the Common Core alignment um, because it is from this that the district determined measures. This is what the district determined measures will be measuring. So we, I wanted to start a little bit um, with this. And there are some slides in here that are very dense, and they're mainly for your information and not to actually um, go over in great detail this evening. I want to talk a little bit um, to remind everybody about the our overarching view of the Common Core State Standards, uh, talk about the major changes that we have put in in terms of literacy and numeracy, give you a current status on our implementation, and talk a little bit about the work that lies ahead. We've been talking a lot about the Common Core over the last year, and we really needed to boil it down to just exactly what does this look like and what does it mean to our students. So if we take the pages and pages and pages of documentation, and there are quite a few of them, on the Common Core, basically it boils down to this. We need to prepare our students to work both independently and collaboratively. They need to be able to analyze and synthesize multiple sources of evidence of varying types. We need to be able to use that evidence. They need to be able to use that evidence in creation of robust arguments, and they need to be able to com communicate those arguments in oral, written, and digital forms. This is what the Common Core means across all subject areas. The ability to analyze and synthesize multiple sources of evidence is important in English language arts, in social studies, in science, and in mathematics. 
and even in world language. The ability to create those <coughs> um, uh, arguments using that evidence, again, crosses all subject areas, and students need to be able to communicate those arguments in oral, written, and digital forms. And why is it important to, to sort of melt it down to this? And that is when you hear the district determine measures, and as we go through the rest of the slides, you're going to hear the word evidence over and over again. When you hear the district determine measures, you're going to hear analyze and synthesize over and over and over again. And you're going to hear things about performance tasks, which are a student's ability to communicate those arguments in oral, written, and digital form. So this is at the heart of everything that we do. When we look at major elements in literacy and what the changes that we've had to make in terms of our curriculum, and we discussed this last time when we talked about the calendar, questions came about, well, we've spent a whole year on the Common Core. Why are we not done? And my answer was that we're done with the, or, or we're fairly done with the documenting of the curriculum, but we, the biggest change in the Common Core is not so much what year you cover what topic, but rather what you ask students to do to be able to demonstrate their knowledge about that topic. So in the area of literacy and reading, there's a staircase of complexity. So students go all the way from the beginnings of reading um, until the demands that are at college and career uh, ready. And they need to be ready for that no later than at the end of high school. And so that's something that we had to realign our curriculum to match. We'll look at progressive development of reading comprehension so that students are advancing through the grades are able to gain more and more from what they read. And that's often termed um, as going from learning to read to reading to learn. They need to be able to read a diverse array of classic and contemporary literature, as well as informational text. And you'll hear a lot about that. Um, students need to be able to be able to gain insights, explore possibilities, and broaden their perspectives. And so we've been working K through 12 at what does literacy look like in terms of reading across all subject areas uh, to make sure that students will be able to meet the needs of the Common Core. In terms of writing, again, the word argument comes back. Substantive claims, talking about evidence, sound reasoning, which you'll hear when we talk about the theories of uh, the uh, pract mathematical practices. You'll hear um, Ms. Dunn talk about research and the focus on research and social studies, and that also comes across in the area of science. It's emphasized through all the standards, but most prominently in the writing strand. Literacy doesn't just involve reading and writing. It also involves speaking and listening in the Common Core standards. So students need to be able to not only gain that information, but uh, gain it through listening and speaking. They need to be able to have academic discussions in one-on-one, -on -one, small group, and whole class settings. So when you hear about the common assessments, you're not going to hear only about paper and pencil tests, but you're also going to hear about other performance assessments. And formal presentations are one way in which students need to have this talk occur, but also informal settings. And those settings need to inc uh, include digital settings, blogs, and uh, online discussions. Vocabulary has a very big emphasis on the Common Core state standards, and so our English language arts and literacy people have been working on how does it look to build that vocabulary. Students need to be able to use formal English, but they also need to be able to make informed and skilled choices. They need to be able to choose the right word and know what the right word would be in each circumstance. The vocabulary and conventions are, not, are treated in their own stand, uh, strand, not because they're in isolation, but that they go across the areas of reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And so I know, for example, Deb Perry has been working with our teachers um, on the discussion of how do you teach grammar and not make kids hate reading and writing at the same time. Mm -hmm. So what is the vision of implementation of literacy on the Common Core? It ha it's cross-disciplinary. The literacy expectations are so that students must be prepared to enter college in the workforce. So what does that look like in practice? Because this is where the rub comes in. Not so much aligning everything on paper, but what it looks like in the classroom. There's an increased rigor. Students need to ab the ability to quickly review and analyze information, and that is not something they are born doing. We need to teach them how to do that. Again, take a stance, create an argument defend that stance with evidence. They need to move well beyond summarization and narrative writing. 
Um, many oftentimes in, in the beginning years especially, we want students to be able to enjoy writing, so we have them writing narratives primarily. Um, that was under the, the formal curriculum. Now we're going to have to be doing informational writing at a very, very early age, right from the beginning. And we need to combine the research and thinking required to understand content area texts and the application of writing skills that are needed. So here's an example of what a prompt might look like that matches the Common Core State Standards from the SATs. You'll notice that this prompt um, provides some background information and then asks students to plan and write an essay in which they develop their point of view on this issue. But they need to support their position with reasoning and examples taken from reading, studies, experience, or observations. They are not asking people to write about their opinion. They're asking them to use evidence to back up their argument. What does that look like in an AP class? Because they may come in in kindergarten, but their goal is to get them here. So there's a sample synthesis essay prompt that talks about television and how it has been influential in presidential elections. It's telling students that they need to take information from six sources, including the introductory information from each source, and then synthesize that information <coughs> from at least three of these sources and incorporate it into a coherent, well-developed essay. If that's what our students need to do by the end, and by the way, these are the sources, one from a book, one from an online article, one from an article in the New Yorker, one from a, a chart that uh, gives some data information, another excer and excerpts from two other books. So in about 45 minutes to an hour, students need to look at this information and then write. How does this skill develop? If you get to there where the AP, where do students need to start? As early as kindergarten, we need students to use a combination of drawing, dictating, and writing to state an opinion or a preference about something, but they need to use evidence. As early as kindergarten, they need to use these things to compose an informational piece. They need to name the topic and supply information about the topic. So all the way from kindergarten to AP, that's what literacy looks like in the Common Core, and that's what we've been working on aligning with this year. In terms of major elements in numeracy, elementary school begins with the focus on number systems and works through our uh, basic operations. And to those things that are the bane of the existence of many a math teacher, fractions, negative numbers, and the beginnings of geometry. That's what we come up with in K through five, and Matt Coleman's been working with the teachers to make sure that their curriculum is aligned in terms of topics this year. When we look at grades 7 through 12, we're building on that solid foundation. And we're, our hope would be, and this is, a, this is a big goal, that students who have completed 7th grade and have mastered the content and skills through 7th grade and mastered the key word here, will be well prepared for algebra in the grade 8. Every student. Now that's a goal. We're not going to be there right from the start, but that is our goal. The middle, middle school school standards are robust and they have rich preparation for high school mathematics. High school standards call, students to, call on students to practice mathematical ways of thinking to real world issues. It also prepares students to go out into college and career readiness to use mathematics in a, a number of situations. And in this case, the key word in that last bullet item is novel situations, to apply mathematics to problems that they have not seen before. Mathematics in grades 7 through 12 needs to emphasize mathematical modeling. That modeling needs to uh, link, again, classroom mathematics and statistics, which you'll, you heard Matt talk about earlier this year, adding statistic class back, back in to everyday life. When making these mathematical models, technology is valuable to varying assumptions, exploring consequences, and comparing predictions with data. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Common Core Standards as early as kindergarten, students need to use uh, technology in both literacy and numeracy, and those are things that we attended to this year. But we need to connect the mathematical standards of, for practice to the common uh, mathematical standards for content. And so we need to look at that base, because if students don't have that base then they're, um, of understanding of that content, they are not going to be able to go to the areas of practice. Just to remind you, these are the standards for mathematical practice, and we need to assess both the standards of content and the standards of mathematical practice. We also need to instruct students so that they are capable of being able to achieve on those assessments. <coughs> 
I'm not going to go through these slides in order, um, in detail, but this is for your um, reference if you want to look back at later at what topics are covered in each grade level so that you can see how we are building towards high school. So where are we now? All our content in, um, is aligned in terms of scope and sequence. The majority of the alignment is documented in Atlas Rubicon, which is our online curriculum mapping system. It will be our focus for the summer and the 13-14 school year to focus on instructional and assessment changes. The scaffolding to increase student expertise and analyst analysis and synthesis. Uh, we need to have explicit instruction and evaluation and selection of evidence because too often, as you know, students Google and they get 450,000 pieces of evidence and they don't know how to tell which ones are the best ones and we need to work with them on that. There needs to be regular practice in the use of making evidence-based arguments and there has to be a significant emphasis in the use of discourse across all subject levels, especially for students to demonstrate what they know and are, and are able to do. So we have two days for each elementary grade for curriculum work and math this summer. Again, focusing more on the instructional techniques and the mathematical practices and discourse. One day for each subject area in 7 through 12 math. Two days for elementary grade level work in literacy, cross-curriculum work in social studies and literacy, Tech University to focus on leveraging technology in order to change instruction, and PD's experiences for our teacher. And, and I, I have to thank Linda Hansen for calling this to my attention. As we looked at that first slide at the beginning that talks about, and I'm going to flip all the way back to it if I can do it fast enough. the overarching view of Common Core State Standards. If we are expecting students to be able to work independently and collaboratively, then we have to have our teachers be able to do that. If we need to be able to analyze and <coughs> have our students analyze and synthesize multiple sources of evidence of varying types, we need to give teachers experiences to do that because this is not the education that they grew up in. We need to give them the opportunity to practice using evidence in the creation of robust arguments and to communicate those arguments in oral, written, and digital forms. And that's where we are right now with the Common Core. And the road ahead of us is much steeper than the road behind us. Questions on that before we go into the next topic? Thank you. Um, any members have any questions for Dr. Chesson on, on that, any of that? Okay, we'll go on. Can you bring up the next poll? So the next thing is, so how are we going to assess this? Arlington is very lucky in that we have had common um, assessments, common formative assessments, and we've talked about this before um, for quite some time. And while we're required to have district-determined measures um, by the state, we want to have district-determined measures for us. But you'll see probably slightly less enthusiasm for district determined measures than the common formative assessments and I'll tell you why. So we're going to review the difference between those two and then I'm going to ask each um, curriculum uh, director to come up and talk about the district determined measures and the common folk, um, formative assessments in their subject area and then I'll just finish up briefly with the work that lies ahead. Common formative assessments which our teachers are doing very extensively is assessment for learning. It allows teachers to adopt instruction based on the evidence, evidence again, making changes and benefits that will immediately benefit student learning. Students can use that evidence to actively manage and adjust their own learning. And the feedback in an assessment is for learning occurs when there's still time to take action. And this is the measure of the highest interest for our teachers. They're very interested in this. I sat in on data meetings this week where people were talking about the DRA scores of students from the fall and the winter and the spring. There was a lot of conversation about how this can inform what students do over the summer and what they do in the fall. District-determined measures are used to make judgments regarding student growth over a yearly basis. They are required as part of the new teacher evaluation system. Um, the assessment of learning is which is what happened on a, an annual basis, and it's most closely tied with the measurements that are in our goals for the district for SGP of 51 or better and uh, the PPI of 75 or better. And they were acquired by the state as part of the new teacher evaluation system. One of the hardest parts about this is that the um, state's directives as to what we need to be able to, do, oh, we need to be able to demonstrate where we are in the district um, have been changing significantly depending on the day. 
Um, but at this point, we're, we were marching in this direction, so they can change what we need to do, but we're gonna be ahead of the curve, and, and I think you'll hear that tonight. And I'm gonna start with um, grades K through five, and I'm gonna ask Linda Hansen to come up and talk about that. Hi, good evening, everybody. So we're gonna look quickly at um, elementary literacy. We'll start off with reading. And this is something you've heard of the DRA, the Developmental Reading Assessment, before. We don't have quite the right slide in here. We do have expectations for kindergarten at the winter and the spring benchmark. None actually when kindergartners come through the door, though. We give them a break for the first couple of months. But these are measures that, student, uh, that teachers understand really well. They know what they mean. They're diagnostic. They're helpful. They're very meaningful for teachers. So I would say that this is a common assessment that we've been using for a number of years in Arlington. But since we need to pick di uh, district determined measures for the state, this is one that we are going to pick at the K through three level because we can also measure beginning and end of year progress, whether or not kids have made a full year's progress in a year's worth of time. No matter where they start, we could still measure what a year from that starting point looks like. In writing, we are kind of bringing together a hybrid of the kinds of on-demand writing assessments that we have done in the past three times a year in the fall, winter, and spring. We're moving, we're, we're keeping that, retaining that writing on demand at the beginning and end of the year, but we're also um, introducing the collection of written pieces that are scored with the rubric after each unit of study in the Lucy Calkins writing program as we move further into the implementation of the Lucy Calkins writing. So what you see here is the on-demand writing prompt and we're gonna work on opinion writing. That's gonna be the focus this year. That was the type of writing that's the newest for teachers. We've been doing a lot of narrative. We do informational, but it was the opinion writing that really was new. So we're gonna focus on that this year. You can, what you see in terms of the units of study is where we have We've had a significant amount of experience in some of the units of study. Some are going to be brand new this year. So we're trying to do an in incremental approach and add bits and pieces each year. So the focus this year will be opinion writing. The following year, will be the focus will be on informational writing. Not that we're not going to do any informational writing this year, but the focus on the new approach and the new expectations will revolve around opinion this year and information writing next year. And I would call this a common assessment. It's diagnostic, it's keeping track of um, kids writing over time, but we will not be using writing as a district determined measure this year as part of our pilot. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Um, when we talk about um, the English department at the middle school and the high school level. We have had common assessments for a long time. In the middle school, um, the teachers get together three times a year. They give um, the writing assessment on certain days and then they have a day or two to work together to get them corrected, to look at the results, to figure out what those results mean and how then they need to change their instruction accordingly. In the high school, the common assessments work somewhat similarly, although we don't have as much time for them to work together. And in fact, for next year, we're actually, actually gonna structure time for them to, to sit down and actually work with each other um, around the common assessments. As it is, currently they, they um, trade information, things that they've learned, and they do it online, and they do it in brief meetings, but they need more time for that. So um, that's one of the things that we, um, we'll use some of the release time for next year in a more concentrated way. The district determined measures um, are gonna add to this whole sense of how students learn to write because we're going to give the same writing um, prompt at the beginning of the year and the end of the year based on something that we think the kids should be able to, to have accomplished by the end of the year. So um, in, in the middle school, we actually have um, some very nice, um, I guess, assessments um, that use 
pieces of video and pieces of nonfiction. The kids look at those on one day, make notes on them, and then the next day um, write according to a prompt, and then those things will be corrected um, with a rubric. Um, many of those, the skills involved in all of that are directly related to the Common Core. So we're looking forward to being able to assess where the kids are, let's say at the beginning of sixth grade, and then see how they've grown in those skills by the time they, they get through the year, and hopefully the teachers have, have addressed most of those things. So that'll be a very accurate way for us to, to see the growth um, that students have made. Um, and then at the high school, we, we're not as geared exactly to all of the common core um, requirements in terms of using media and using other elements because the writing that we tend to do in English classes is, is argument based but it often uses literature and sometimes uses various kinds of literature to compare and contrast and that's, the, that's what we'll be testing um, at the beginning of the year and again at the end the same kind of thing. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. All right, so um, as it is right now uh, for us, you know, the common assessments, the DDMs, I think there is a lot of crossover for math. And one of the things that we're trying to do is, for me anyways, avoid like assessment overload. So what I'm trying to do is actually intertwine the two and totally redesign what we're doing for our common assessments so that it actually has all the DDM stuff embedded inside of it. Um, so right now in, in K through five, we're a little bit more of the developmental stage because some of this stuff hasn't been there already. I would say all of our common assessments uh, at the elementary level are usually unit uh, assessments that don't really show growth because all you're doing is you know, summative assessments for the end of the chapter. So right now, uh, some of the work we're doing right now is just developing diagnostic tests. Our summer work is gonna be really fleshing out this entire system. For six through 12, uh, the next slide. This is what we're going to try to do, and this is a model we're going to hope to bring down to the elementary school, but we're much more uh, ahead of the game, I think, for the high school. Uh, our diagnostics, if I look at the f kind of uh, f common assessments we have, our diagnostics initially at the beginning of the year were always kind of basic skills. So we're going to totally revamp it uh, and try to embed some of this DDM concept inside. So we'll still keep the basic skills, and that's going to be part of the growth that we'll look at, how, how students are doing overall. Uh, there are certain things that I would consider foundational concepts that any course would need that you probably had from prior. That's going to be a big part of our anchor of, of growth. Um, how do they do with these core foundational ideas, let's say, before algebra that really tie to algebra so we can look to see how the overall concepts develop. Uh, the weird little twist is, we want to kind of maintain this idea of a formative assessment, so we're going to try to embed in that initial diagnostic also stuff that's for the first unit. So I'll use something like an Algebra 2 course. Uh, I think we're going to do a statistics unit as one of the first things for Algebra 2. So some of the ideas uh, in that initial diagnostic at the beginning of the year will have some statistics, so that way it's giving the, the teacher some data that they can use initially, some data where they can look for growth, uh, and data they can see for where the child came from. So we're just trying to milk this thing for a lot. Uh, Laura had talked about the fact that we have multiple content and process standards to deal with. So we're going to try to put an open-ended writing assignment. Um, then what's going to happen throughout the rest of the year is the mid-year exam will have components of the mid-year that looks back at your basic skills so that we can measure growth from there. It'll look back at the foundational concepts and see how well they did the, with the stuff that's relevant to that unit. Um, the, you know, the, the idea of a, an initial diagnostic, one at the beginning and one at the end of the year, like inevitably you can show a lot of growth if that initial diagnostic is all the stuff they're going to learn. So what I'm thinking of is more chunking it in like a first half and a second half and, and showing growth throughout. The last little thing we're going to kind of tie in, and this kind of goes with the growth of the overall writing and communication, that initial diagnostic will have writing at the beginning of the year, but then instead of trying to make every one of these big assessments so like huge, uh, at the end of the first term, there'll be another open-ended writing assignment. At the end of the third term, there'll be an open-ended writing assignment. So what we hope to do is to kind of look at the standards going through and then look at the writing and look at the communication skills going through. So we can just kind of uh, uh, 
hopefully have this as our overall structure. The, the teachers have been working on the diagnostic and they're coming up with really good things that they, they've used before and just kind of putting it together, um, which is kind of nice so far. Any questions? Hi, all. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll warn you, my second slide is, is missing, but I'll, I'll submit that later, um, and I can certainly talk about what was on it. Um, so I'll start with where we are now in social studies. We do have common assessments in place, um, and we feel very good about them. Um, we feel that they're actionable and, and allow us to, to intervene and, and help students who are struggling throughout the year and identify skills where there are strengths and skills where students need help. Um, we have unit-based common assessments in grade six. Um, we do an excellent nonfiction writing-based assessment six times over the course of grade seven aligned with each unit, but it is the actual same assessment, just the content that the students write about and the actual source that they use changes with each unit. And in grades eight through 11, we have three common assessments per year. Some grades actually have more, but we have a standard of three per year. Um, one is students applying a technology skill or a platform that they've learned in class um, and making a presentation, designing a website, that sort of thing based on content that they've learned in history class. Um, we do a thorough research process that culminates in the production of a thesis and research paper um, based on students' own research. And then we have a common final exam. So that's what we have in place now. Um, we'll be able to use some of that in the development of our district determined measures, but we do have to make a few changes. So I'll talk about what, what it will look like next year and going forward. Um, grade seven, actually, we're going to keep exactly the same. We'll use our first and our last of our nonfiction writing um, assessments as our, our two measures within a year. Grade six will be focusing on source analysis throughout the year and we'll use a first early sample and a late in the year sample of source analysis um, as our measurements. Grade eight, eight through 11, we're really going to focus on the umbrella of research skills and source analysis in all of our district determined measures. So um, what we do need to add and we're working on now is an early in the year grade level appropriate diagnostic to assess students' research skills when they enter the grade, and then we'll use the thesis slash research paper that students complete late in the year um, as the second sample measurement where based on a variety of measures that the teacher will look at in the paper, um, the teacher will be able to determine their, app, their skill at that point in time um, in meeting our, our research and writing goals. So let me tell you where we are with the common assessments. Um, we didn't have common assessments in my department prior to me beginning. So last year, we spent the entire year really developing what we wanted our common assessments to look like. And this year, we've piloted them. Um, so to give you an overview, in the modern languages, we decided to focus the three common assessments around the three modes of communication. So these are really crucial in um, foreign language study. You have interpretive communication, which is when you are faced with um, a resource like a radio announcement or a news article and you have to inter read and understand what it is that you're what you're presented with interpersonal communication is when you have basically a two-way exchange uh, conversation or email exchange with someone else and presentational communication is basically what I'm doing right now you've prepared a discussion or you've prepared an essay or a writing that you present um, and we also wanted to incorporate the four key skills um, in foreign language reading listening speaking and writing so that's essentially the way we have framed the common assessments um, and by focusing on really a skill and a mode of communication this is something we can track the progress of it's not very um, it's not based on sort of the discrete content it's a skill that can be tracked up the levels for the classical languages, um, which is Latin in our district, we focused on the tr skill of translation and reading comprehension. So that's where we are with the common assessments. 
Um, and I want to just report before I talk about our, the district determined measures, I actually spent the day um, in Marlboro at um, a DESC district determined measure anchor standard panel, uh, anchor development panel, it's a long wordy title, um, and I served on the French one to two um, a panel where we really were looking at the curriculum frameworks and coming up with anchor standards that could then be used to help districts develop the district determined measures. Um, and so the next step would be to submit exemplars to the state um, for them to vet. And I actually felt very, very good coming out of the meeting today. I feeling like that we were really addressing the standards that will be used as um, a, you know the anchor standards for the state. So I feel very confident about that. So the two district determined measures that we're planning to use for next year, um, we decided to choose the interpersonal communication and the presentational communication skill for the modern languages. So to give you an example, um, in let's say Spanish one, <coughs> the students have to have you know, basic conversation, hello, how are you, what's your name, tell me, you know, a little bit of, of about, information about yourself. Um, we have been filming these, we have rubrics that we've developed um, that really track the progress up the proficiency scales. So the rubrics are reflect the ACTFL, which is the American Council in the Teaching of Foreign Languages, proficiency scale going from novice to intermediate to um, low advanced. Um, so we have all five rubrics to kind of track the students as they go up um, in the levels. And then to jump up to Spanish three, the students are looking at a piece of artwork um, by like Dali or a famous Spanish uh, painter. And they have to have a conversation with each other and ask, what is your opinion of this based on what? So there is some bringing in of evidence, you know, what, where, what movement is this from or whatever. So the, the conversation becomes increasingly complex as the students move up. In the presentational um, assessment, we focused on writing. So they have an in-class essay. And it's really the same thing where at level one, you've got a very basic, you know, tell me about your family or about food that you like to eat. And then as they go up the levels, it becomes increasingly complex in terms of what they're able to write and report on, um, give evidence or give or give, make develop an argument on you know, X topic and you know, support it with whatever. So it really focuses on um, just this increase in difficulty on a very you know, a specific skill. So that's the overview. And very briefly, the, the classical languages for Latin, again, it's a translation. We have level appropriate passages. The students have to translate them. The Latin teachers also developed rubrics that reflect um, the skill as it progresses up in difficulty as the text move from um, I guess sort of leveled readers up into authentic Latin um, where, you know, with, it just becomes increasingly difficult for them to, um, to, interp to translate as well as with the reading comprehension. So that's it in a nutshell. Hi, thank you for letting us share our work with the staff and students with you. In the, in the science department, as Dr. Cheston said, there, there are two, two areas that we have to watch. There's content and there's, and there's practices. <clears throat> we are focusing on two areas of common assessments and, and district determined measures. They overlap to some extent, especially in the area of content. Although our common assessments tend to be more frequent and sometimes smaller. Than, than the uh, larger district determined measures that we are, are in the process of developing and, and utilizing. So in, in our first area of focus, we're analyzing pre and post testing data on uh, topical or, or longer periods of time. And we're trying to figure out where, where it's best to use smaller groups of time like a topical unit as our district determined measure and where it's best to use year-long assessment. And that's determined, in a sense, by us, by, by what the needs are. Each course is a little different. Each time of the school, uh, of the student's life is a little different. So we are choosing critical areas, topical areas, areas that show weakness, uh, areas that have special needs, and high needs, I mean, um, and some of these are, we're exploring and, and trying things like flipped classrooms and how to introduce questions that are, are long-term questions that, that's, that we can get some sense of what's happening to a student's understanding throughout the year by monitoring those questions and we're using that as a district determined measure. And then our second area of focus is on, on growth and 
as the Common Core, the, uh, the area of science has a newly developed framework called the Next Generation Science Standards. It's just come out a week, uh, month ago. And <clears throat> from that framework, the, Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts is now revising its science standards. And those will be finished in fall. And, I, and I've um, spoken with Dr. Bodie in the past <coughs> about, about coming, when those are finalized, coming and trying to uh, give an explanation of where they are and what they're all about. But those, the next generation science standards, in a sense, overlap with, with the ELA and Mathematics Common Core. It has practices, and, the, and a very significant overlap of those practices deal with creating arguments from evidence, being able to communicate and interpret scientific writings, knowing what the meaning of the data is, and, and so, we're basing our second focus of district determined measures on measuring that growth. It's, it's part of the Common Core, it's part of the next generation science standards. We are, are looking at um, kids' abilities to read and write about scientific articles. And recently, last, even as recently as last week, we, we are piloting some measures. <clears throat> we had our 10th graders involved in a biology symposium organized by our biology teachers, which student, all, all of the 10th grade biology students presented their findings on scientific readings that they had done. They synthesized their own report from reading multiple scientific papers and had to explain that to a panel of students and, and adults from the community. So the, the the kinds of skills that come out of that are things that we're trying to measure now with, with uh, a rubric base. And it could take the form of lab reports or scientific articles, and we're still exploring other possibilities. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. <clears throat> um, so you've heard from the five major subject areas, but the state requirement is that we have district determined measures across every educator. Um, we have one uh, district determined measure fitness gram uh, that's currently, uh, actually has been used for quite some time in PE. Um, we are in the process of creating and piloting um, two district determined measures in music, art, and health. Um, and we're in the process of creating and piloting uh, two district determined measures for the work of related service providers, such as um, guidance counselors and OT and speech and language pathologists. Um, I think that one of the things that's evident, but just uh, in addition to the fact that you've heard the same words over again, evidence, synthesized, analyzed, writing, um, using content, but not, not just knowing the content or learning the content, but using the content, is that these um, district determined measures came from the staff. Uh, we did not tell them what they should do. It came from the teacher level, and that is a very unique um, uh, way of handling this when we talk to other districts. And um, we still need to um, negotiate the final version of the district determined measures with the union, um, but I think that developing it from the ground up will really help us um, get buy-in from teachers. They're choosing the measures that they want to um, have their success be determined by. Um, so questions for myself or anybody else? Thank you. Um, why don't we start with uh, you can start. Okay. round robin? I'll start. Um, first, I want to make sure I've got the concepts right because it finally clued in. So the common assessments are like little tests that you do at any point and they just measure, do they know this or not? Uh, and then, yes. And then they inform the instruction, right. They may not be a test, but, they, but I get, yeah, I get yeah, what the yeah. point. I mean, yeah. it, it's a, a mm -hmm. test in the bigger, broader right. sense. Yes. Um, and then the district determined measurements are like a yardstick. You need a beginning and an end, and you're measuring what's in between. Right. And you want to know if you went all of 36 inches. Okay. You got it. Um, so then um, my second question is for subject areas which are assessed via the standardized tests, such as MCAS or, or uh, the New Park or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you plan to go back and see how the district determined measures correlate with what we find, what results we see on the MCAS? And can I just explain where I'm yeah, coming from with this? So 
as we roll all these valuations forward, part of what's rolled back with the calendar is that the district goals need to be set much earlier now. Mm -hmm. And so we're not going to have the MCAS back at that point. Right. And so if we have robust information coming from the district determined measures, that is helpful. <laughs> Well, one of the things that will be helpful is that, and I'm going to ask Matt to come up here because he knows park more inside and out than I do, um, but that some of the park um, the measurements will actually be back much quicker than the MCAS, and if we do the park online, um, we're going to get almost all the results back by the time you want to set district goals. But uh, oh, okay. can you talk about the yeah. other? So um, the way park is structured is uh, right now there'll be an assessment three through, you know, certain level of high school uh, through 75% of the year as well as as close to the end of the year as possible. So the one that's the 75% of the way through the year will include some writing assessments, both ELA and mathematics. So what they want is that extra time to be able to grade those in between. So what they're saying right now is that you take the 75% of the way through, they have that little chunk of time to grade, you take the as far as the end of the year, once that's in, you should have all of your assessment data within a week. Wow. So as long as you're doing it online. Okay. So mm -hmm. it, it's a quick turnaround because the one at the end of the year is going to be all computer based. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be uh, person scored. Um, so, you know, people have asked, you know, 75 percent, can we get that back sooner? But it's not going to be until after the other one's done. So it's quicker than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for math, I could say one of the things that I'm trying to do with our DDMs is actually mimic what they're doing for park. Mm -hmm. um, just because, you know, we need to, it's, it's not a bad structure. You know, park in the long run, what they essentially would like to do is do an initial diagnostic, a mid-year exam, 75%, 95%. So you have this idea of the growth all the way through. But right now, the only two that are mandatory components are the 75 and 95% of the way through the year. Okay, thank you. Ms. Heim? Um, just to piggyback a little bit off of um, Dr. Alice Nampi, in terms of the um, measures, we're going to be having a beginning of the year to set that baseline. We're going to be having an end of the year. Um, I think one of the challenges in the past with some of our common assessments that we've had grade level is when they've um, assessed prior learning that's taken place before that year, um, so that determination of skill base, there's um, the um, temptation for teachers to actually go back to curriculum that actually was a previous year's curriculum because of the foundation. Um, I know for formative assessments, there's a certain amount where teachers need to address gaps before they actually can move on with new information. Where this is going to be tying into the evaluation, what safeguards are going to be in place to make sure that the teachers don't get so tied up in what the children are coming into their room with to begin with, that they're not actually spending adequate time on what the curriculum is for that year? Because there's no way we can assess every single component of what they're doing. So are, do I understand your question to be if at the beginning of the year, if I have a diagnostic, and then I realized that my students didn't learn everything that they learned the previous year that I would spend time reviewing as opposed to covering the new curriculum. Is that the question you're well, asking? That's part of the question, definitely. That's an age-old question in the sense that as a math teacher, there's always the temptation, um, you know, there was always the temptation to spend the beginning of the year reviewing thinking, well, they didn't get it, so I'm going to give it to them. Um, I'm going to you know, ask Mac to chime in if I'm incorrect, but um, there is so much material that has to be covered, and as we talked about, when, you know, those charts were very busy and I didn't go through everything from grades K through 8, but in order to be um, ready or close ready to algebra by 8th grade, if you take too many steps backwards, you're never going to take enough steps forwards. So I, I understand it's tied to the evaluation system, but I think one of the best things about that is that's why we've asked teachers to design these assessments and that we'll be also working with teachers to understand that that's only one piece of evidence that we're using and we'll be very clear about um, the reliant, the lack of reliance that we'll have on that. Um, we need to look at a, a, you know, a teacher's performance in, in a broader sense. And I think that that's going to be part of the trust thing. And that's what, that's what the whole educator evaluation system is based on trust and about discourse between evaluator and educator. And as long as we, 
you know, keep to that and keep building that trust, I think we'll avoid that. Um, but I do think that that was always a problem even before there was a district determined measure that teachers would say, well, they didn't learn this or that and, and try to go back and, you know, spend the first six weeks of school reviewing. And um, one other question, and it once again piggybacks off of one of Dr. Allison um, <coughs> some of some of the measures have been in place for a long time. There's a lot of evidence to support that they've been well developed. Um, we're, they're actually mapping to other tools that we've used and showing their validity. On the um, areas where there have not been, or grade spans where there have not been those measures, what um, ways are you going to have to normalize the data that you're getting from it and to make sure that it actually is an accurate assessment? Because taking that step back sometimes is a challenge when so much time has been invested in. Right, we need to make sure that there's a correlation to other measures that we see. So for example, in English language arts, if we have an assessment that shows that you know, a variety of students have gotten to a certain level uh, at writing and reading, and then we have the park assessment, and it doesn't match up, or uh, you, you, ha you have to take a grain of salt with classroom grades because there's so much involved in effort. A student can actually score, as we well know, very well on the MCAS, but not have good classroom grades, um, and vice versa, as a matter of fact. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that, that, that we're looking at the same type of assessment. So that is why we will not be throwing our common informative assessments aside, and that information will also. So we have to look at the whole picture and put all those pieces of information together. It, I don't know that normed, I mean, the DRA has a normed database, sort of, but in some ways, because you can look at what an A1 is, but then again, an individual teacher does that assessment and so um, unless you were constantly calibrating it you know it, you, it there's some subjectivity that's involved and the same thing with any of these assessments except for the ones that are scantron so I mean I think we have to look at it in terms of all the other data that's there I, I don't know that we'll have it norm referenced um, in in this in the the strictest sense of the word ever but we will be piloting it we will be looking at these assessments and saying do that does what we see make sense and if it doesn't, then we'll have to talk about possibly changing the assessment. And, and forgive me, because you may have mentioned this, is there the idea of actually pooling evaluation of student performance on the assessments? So um, the teacher that has those children is not necessarily the only one that's seeing seeing the open response portion or this or that. Absolutely, I mean, that's one of the, that's at the heart of a professional learning community um, to do cross um, grading and calibration grading. Um, and also at, at the elementary level, they have an, um, we're talking about increasing the um, frequency of it, um, but they have regular meetings where they look at data across students altogether. So all those things will continue to happen. Thank you. So I wanna pick up on the point that Matt made about um, embedding the district determined measures in the common assessments. To what degree can we do that in other subject areas? You, you're going to do that in math? That's where we can, you know, I, I, just, that's what you're, I think yeah. almost everybody in the, att in the effort to try to not be constantly assessing yeah. um, and having assessment overload is, is going to try to do that to the largest extent possible. There's always some overlap with district determined measures and common formative assessments. Um, and we go for the greater degree of overlap as makes sense. I mean, district determined measures tend to just be bookended, and so the common f we need more frequent assessments um, in order to know whether we need to change our instruction. Okay, so it's a goal of all the department heads to yes, try to. Yes, okay, it is. That, that's that's yep. that's what I want to understand. And what I mean, and and <clears throat> and also, so we have common assessments now aligned with the Common Core, and now that we did world language with in all subject areas, right? Uh, yeah, I should, they're aligned with the content of the Common Core. We, need, we are in the process of aligning our assessments with the instructional emphasis of the Common okay. Core. But that's pretty, I mean, that's, I think that's something you should all be very pleased yeah. with. I mean, that's, that's quite an yep. achievement. So, and I suspect that's ahead of a, several, many districts. Yes, yes. I mean, I would say that science, there will be possibly be some shifting because the next generation science standards just came out. Mm -hmm. um, but aside from that, yes. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I'm, looking at, I'm looking upon this as really being a standards-based operation. 
that these district determined measures are really tied to standards and what mm -hmm. we're looking to do is align our assessments to standards and to really be tracking our students uh, to standards and one of the things that I'm really interested in is, is how we assess and report out the standards of mathematical practice I mean this this is new for teachers and parents to deal with and I'm wondering what we're doing to communicate that part of the standards to to our parents. Oh, yeah. it, I mean, well, it, I agree. I actually think that this is something that, not to make it a huge issue, that, that even Park and, and everybody is struggling with, is that these are habits. These are ways in which we want our kids to think. And you want to embrace that within the, the assessments. So the way I'm going to tackle it, the way I'm going to go for it is uh, with those writing assignments that are much more open-ended, mm -hmm. that do encourage, it does ask for the students to do, um, do the mathematics, but the certain qualities are going to be, uh, when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking more of a holistic or qualitative rubric that we can actually look at what they're doing. Um, so we'll keep track of that. Uh, the next thing we have to do, and you're saying conveying this information, mm -hmm. you know, I could say for the elementary school right now, we have to totally revamp and redevelop what our report card is. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age, in the way in which we collect our information, like for me, I want to reimagine how we convey this. I want to start to use the technology to, to you know, you, you kind of alluded to the fact that we're going standards based. I don't want to create a list of every single standard and say met, not met, you know, emerging. I'd like to do something a little bit more um, uh, consumable. Um, so for, for us right now, um, you know, we're, we're going to work on these writing assignments, work on things that are more holistic. We're going to create that rubric that really matches up with what we want to see. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the elementary school specifically, we're going to start to work on this summer. Nadine Solomon, who's one of the elementary math specialists, and I are going <coughs> to work with some teachers, do some research, figure out what's out there. And then a bulk of next year, a good portion of next year, is going to be spent trying to design and, and create something that we feel pretty comfortable with that actually is um, you know, parent-friendly, uh, consumable-friendly, that, that people can read. And it's meaningful to them as well, because uh, I think that is a big issue. I don't have a, a great answer for you right now, but that's something that we already know we need to work on. Yeah, I, I think this is something that we're all in, in, in the business yeah. working on, and we've uh, started to incorporate some of the standards of mathematical practice right. into our elementary report card in Lowell. Yep. And, and, you know, it, it, it's a journey, and we're looking at how it worked this year and, and, and what do we have to do to tweak it next year. But the statement that really caught my ear was that uh, uh, MCAS as an indicator does not necessarily correlate well with report card grades and, and, and because effort and, and other things that get mixed in there get in there and, and, and I'm a little uncomfortable with that because you know I, I've got to say that if what we're really stating is that students need to make standards that our grading system needs to reflect standards and not how pretty the cover is on the report or or, or whether the kid is a good compliant student within the classroom. I, I, I think that... Uh, I think you might have missed... Uh, what I'm talking yeah. about is that a student may not um, turn in a project or they may not turn in homework, and that's going to be reflected in their grade. But, however, when you give them a uh, mm -hmm. the MCAS, they may have mastered the standards for that grade level, and it may come across in their score. So does a kid who masters the content yet doesn't turn in the project fail the class. That's a longer discussion, I think, than we have time for tonight. <laughs> I mean, but that, I think that's the discussion that this is leading to. Right. Not, I'm not asking for the answer, but I'm saying this is a question that a, we need a, to be addressing yeah. and it's, be, it's, be a part of, because I think that as a district, we need to advance uh, into this area with our eyes open. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's certainly something we have to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> you got a Catholic school. Okay. Hey, quickly, guys, because we're running, we're running real late. Um, Ms. Starks, I, I don't want to. Add, no. Mr. Hader, I'd just like to thank you all, and without being nasty about it, this new talk in Boston about all this new technology that the uh, high tech people want to add to the uh, the whole curriculum and everything. They want everybody to take computer science from grade seven. But, yeah, but they should some of the it. stuff that I've been <laughs> listening to, they sound like they were, they're talking about redoing the whole thing over again, which is common with DESE, that once we get it working, they have to shuffle the deck again. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much for everything. Yes, and 
May, may I respectfully request that if the members come up with other questions, because tonight was so much in so little time for us to digest, can, may we may we submit questions to the superintendent Absolutely. or to the department heads or, yes. or CC yes. everyone? Yes, sure. That would yeah. be wonderful, and I'd love to see Linda. some of this. Yep, uh, I would love to see some of this come back to us during the course of this coming year, yes. this year of transition. And I forgot to introduce Linda Hansen, our AEA rep at the at the table here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I snuck in a little bit, I think, after you'd started your formal meeting. Since this is really the first meeting, I believe, that they, they've addressed district-determined measures in front of the school committee, I do feel the need to just kind of make a couple points here. One is that I do appreciate the work that Massachusetts has done. I feel like on behalf of educators and administrators and school committees to say one standardized test is not going to be the be-all, end-all that you're going to be measured against or that kids are going to be measured against. So we've come up with this thing, which is good in concept, called district-determined measures. It's never going to be a normed, standardized thing, nor should it be. If we think about the money, the time, the, the size, the population size, the expertise that the state has put into developing these standardized tests, we have that. So this doesn't need to replicate that. It should, it should mirror and match the standards, but it should be important and meaningful to teachers when you give these things can make all the difference of the world. We could give a reading test the first week after kids come back from summer vacation, and what you're measuring is summer loss, basically. If we take it two weeks later, we're going to get a different result. If we're going to measure kids at the end of the year based on that dipstick in the fall, it depends when you get it. My point is that I want us to really keep some common sense in all of this and just not think about it as needing to replicate. We have a standardized test, and we're going to have more. Park, I actually think that someday, Park, if we get into these 75%, 95%, they're even talking about mid-year writing samples earlier on. If we have one comprehensive set of assessments, we don't need to mm -hmm. replicate that. We need to understand why, what the purpose is that we're using these other parallel assessments for. Um, and also just the measurability of it. I know teachers are really concerned about what does a year growth look like in terms of research skills or an on-demand writing prompt? What does a half year of growth look like? So cohort size, are we measuring year over year? Are we tracking one cohort through, you know, as they go up through the grades? So I just feel like this is a really um, intricate, exercise that we're all going to be entering in on and I just want us to go in thoughtfully and to keep doing kind of a, a gut check on making sure it makes sense for kids and for teachers. So. All right well thank you Dr. Chesson. Thank, thank you everyone, uh, Thanks, all our department heads, thank you very very much. Okay, so we are moving on to uh, approval of the school calendar for 2013-2014. Would uh... Uh, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this has been a very collaborative effort, and certainly a lot of input from all of you been doing moving forward with this. One of the things, just to put again in perspective, what we've been trying to do is to be. Uh, much more ahead of where we've been in the past. Before, we didn't even get conferences on the calendar until the fall. And what we felt was very strongly is that we really needed to have a calendar at the end of the year where people knew where, what the, where the early release days, professional day, vacations. Now, the major things we've we did back in December. What we have been looking at very carefully is how we're going to be able to do all the professional development we need to do next year, which is extensive. And I think you get a sense of that here. And this is just part of the whole picture. There's so many other initiatives and mandates that are being uh, uh, required of us. So we also were listening to parents, particularly elementary parents, who were concerned about the number of early release days. And last time we told you we had brought the number from 13 <coughs> down to 11, and that was the number sticking in our head. In that time frame, feedback we had from the principals of the elementary schools was, and feedback from their teachers, 
because they were actually counting it up. If I have 25 kids in my class and I meet with parents for 20 minutes at conferences, I need so, many, so much time. And the time that we had allotted was insufficient, particularly if a teacher had a large class. And we have some classes next year that will be 28 students. So the elementary principals asked us if we would also include elementary in one of the conference days that we had designated for middle school as well, which actually brings it up to 12. Now, we had told you, we had told you we would try to stick to 11, but that's why it changed. Now, if you want to reduce one of the early release days for elementary, you know, that would be your prerogative. But I will tell you that we have, Laura, Dr. Cheston has worked with the, uh, with our curriculum leaders and with principals around all of what we need to be able to fit in next year, and it's tight. We could use even more than we have, but on the other hand, it's always a balance between, you know, what we could use and what is reasonable for families. So with that little sort of overview of this, I want to get, turn, the, turn this over to Laura, who is, we have a, a, a calendar here, um, and you saw both versions of it, one which did not have the November 19th and one that did. but. Laura, do you want to? I, I just want to add, and not because I know we're running late, around, uh, late but we have um, 12 days for elementary, as we said, uh, Dr. Bodie said. Two of those are conference days. Two days are for um, work for the teacher on the new teacher evaluation system. That leaves us the remaining days to be split up three days to math, three days to common core literacy one day for science and one day for social studies. So science and social studies are really getting the short end of the stick. Um, but, and, and that's gonna be very difficult when we have the new generation science standards, but it's also more difficult because as we look at the Common Core for uh, standards for literacy, as you heard tonight, those are not just for the reading and writing and the literature that has to do with the, the vanilla literacy, um, but science <coughs> has literacy standards in them. Social studies have literacy standards in them. So if we have to cut back that one day, um, then we're going to be forced with the choice of where is that going to come from. Mm -hmm. um, certainly it can't come from the conferences. Certainly it, it cannot come from the new teacher evaluation system. So that means that we're going to have to look at the core four subject areas in order to say that they would not have a half-day professional development day. And, and and to be realistic, they they get out you know at one. It's not like they really have a, a whole full day. They have a, a chunk of time, and it's a good chunk of time. And we're very grateful for that time. Um, but as Dr. Bodie said, we could really you know have used more. But we're happy if we could get the twelve. Questions for the superintendent or Dr. Chesson, Bill? The professional development day that you have, I'm looking at. I think it's on both. Yes, uh, in November. We talked about it before. I, I see that you have two teacher days prior to the school year starting. That's correct. Why wasn't that either put at the beginning or at the end, at, after the students uh, leave? Instead of, instead of November uh, 1st. 1st, thank you, uh, have it f uh, June, for right now, June uh, 19th. Well, the, the the purpose of the professional day um, at that time of the year, which I, I think that there's a universal um, feeling that this is a really um, uh, a timely place in this because we are able to um, have a whole variety of opportunities for our teachers. One of the things that I think we need to do among many next year is to have time for um, our PLCs to be have, to working on their team goals and have a chunk there. We need to have more technology workshops. That's the time, once you get your year established, you're, you're ready to look at, um, and, and you're getting to that point, it's time to look at other ways that you're going to be sort of mapping the rest of the year, year out. The end, certainly a professional day at the end of the year would be terrific for other reasons. Um, the, the first two days, how, that, the, how those work by contract is that half of the day is district determined 
and half of it uh, is for teachers to have in their classrooms to prepare. Um, we, we, this year, instead of having an opening day speaker, because our need is so great uh, for curriculum overviews, we're, we are going to start with a, a convocation of sort, but it's going to be very, it's going to be very time limited, so we can give almost the entire morning to grade level and department level time to go over the work that's done this summer. Day two of those early days are given to faculty meetings at each one of the schools. And they use that. We have a whole array of mandates that have to be, we have to go through every year um, in terms of trainings around FERPA, for example. So all of that happens the second day. And that's how those first two days are used. Um, well, let's go around. Um, Jeff. Uh, you know, we've discussed the calendar a lot. And I, <clears throat> I support the, um, the professional development days that we have. Um, I'm always concerned that there, there is not enough time to do adequate professional development. Uh, it's just, but I think we should um, adopt the uh, calendar. So I'm just going to move approval of the calendar so it's on the uh, draft second. A or B. Okay. Draft day or draft day is the one that has the November 19th draft date day. in it. Draft okay. day. <coughs> Was there a second to draft day? Okay. Second. Further discussion on that motion. Um, <coughs> Ms. Okay. Dr. Yeah. Anthony, I saw you first. I'll vote for it, but with reluctance because I feel that this is a burden on our families, mm -hmm. and I'm still hoping that we can come up with some other alternatives. Ms. Hine. Um, I was just going to point out that whenever I've been part of professional development, there's always been this discussion about the need for teachers to go back to their classroom the next day and implement it immediately. And that's how districts provide effective professional development to allow it to become embedded and not ask people to remember it over the summer or not be able to try it out right away because they're busy getting kids settled into a new routine and schedule and don't really start instruction for you know a week later and so while this is challenging for our families given i think given our responsibility to provide good professional development for our staff and the benefits it gives to our students when the teachers are given additional opportunities to expand their knowledge and integrate into their classrooms um, this is the least detrimental to the timeliness of instruction and is going to provide the most opportunity for it to be worthwhile. Anyone else? Uh, vote. Mr. Hanna? I'm going to vote for it also, but I think we've, we spend an all, awful lot of time discussing this several meetings during the year. I think it's it would be good for us to look at the calendar and come up with some creative ways to meet the teacher needs, the professional development needs, and the parent needs. I don't know if it can be done, but I, need, I think we should spend more time at a meeting doing this. Thank you. Okay, I just want to echo a couple of words from my colleagues and add a couple of my own. Uh, Dr. Ampey, I couldn't agree more. Uh, over the course of this last year, I heard so much in the way of parental um, concern, aggravation with the breakup of our year. Um, I look at 2013, 2014, and I see EMS and ECR, right? These are two conference dates. Um, Friday the 6th of December and Tuesday the 10th of December okay so for a working family to do an 1115 on a Friday and then the following Tuesday back-to-back -back weeks I think that's really really hard and um, in terms of professional development 12 early release for that teacher eval two days could we not have some sort of teacher eval study over the summer I mean these are teacher eval um, professional development, I mean, I'm sure can be done on an individual basis too. I'd love to see next year something in the way of, as Mr. Hainer was suggesting, some sort of more creative out of the box thinking, see a survey. I want to see, uh, the principals say their teachers need the professional development. I want to see the teachers on the ground in the classrooms say, we need 13 days where we're going to uh, do early release. I'd love, to, I'd love to see some type of survey, some, some teachers come in here and say this is absolutely necessary. Um, because this is really hard. This is really hard for, for, for me to approve. I will, I will vote yes on this. I think it's important the school committee come down and say, this is our school calendar. It's important for, for, the, for the public out there to know that we're voting on this tonight. 
uh, with respect to high school graduation. It is a change. I want everyone to know that there's going to be a change to high school graduation from Sundays, where they were customary, to a Saturday. And this was sort of brought on, and, and I don't know how this developed. You know, what was the genesis of that? You know, who was called in to think about doing that? Um, so there are a lot of changes here, and for the second straight year, there's going to be 13, 12 plus 1, 12 early release and one pro pro professional development day, 13 days where, there, where there's going to either be no school or early release. And I'd love to see 2014-2015 calendar where it downgrades a little bit because we're not going to be in a year of transition. We're not going to have to deal with a new teacher eval system and a common core system. It will already have been implemented. So I'd love to see a little bit more um, creativity and less breaks in our day and our year for, for working, working families. So, that said, uh, all those in favor of the 2013-2014 draft day school calendar say aye. 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 All those against? Okay. Kara, 7-0. Thank you. All right, we will get this up on the website so people can have that. <coughs> Thank you. Moving on. Uh, approval of data assistant job description. Okay, well, this is a position that was, uh, it, it is in the budget for uh, this, uh, this current uh, fiscal year, this next fiscal year. Um, based on the needs of all the data needs in the district and the move to central registration, um, our director of, uh, of data has a lot of data responsibilities right now, lots of reports that have to be, be done, and has taken on the role of central registrar for the district as well. So she has asked, and we have felt that there's a need for um, some part-time support down there. This would be an assistant, an administrative assistant position, 20 hours a week. This would be a unit C position and um, would uh, be posted in accordance with the unit C contract and um, are looking for someone who is, you know, has some data experience, who is, has good technical skills, um, very precise, detail-oriented, um, and can uh, work with the director of data to accomplish all the, the reporting that needs to be done all, and um, the central registration. Okay. Do we have a motion? I'm going to move approval. Second. Okay. Discussion? Mr. Hanna? Quick question. Is this person under unit C? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Anything else? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Oh. Um. <laughs> Sorry. I'll catch you next time. What? Do, do you have something? I, okay. I did have Dr. a question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I don't see anything about um, confidential data that isn't the stuff that they're dealing, I mean, should that be mentioned in the job description or just a recognition that the data, that the data is, is confidential? Yeah. yeah we, we could add that. Um, um, isn't that there under item number six? <clears throat> okay, sorry, I missed it. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. You okay, never mind. All right. Cool. Everything? Okay. okay, everyone, all right. Um, moving on. Did we, did we have some vote? We did vote. Okay. Okay. District goals, 2013-2014, our second reading, and uh, a vote to approve these goals. Dr. Bowden. Um, the committee spent quite a, quite a lot of time at the beginning of this year looking at overarching goals. And as we look to next year, um, We've had a lot of discussion at the table both, and we've had a lot of discussion at, with the administrative team as to what would be the, uh, the, 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 fo the major foci of next year. And I think that the goals that uh, you see here that we, we've talked about it more even in, in, during retreat uh, reflects the efforts that we, the, the primary efforts. Doesn't mean there's not a lot of other things that are going to be happening. Um, but that we want to particularly focus on. As far as, as my particular goals for next year, we'll, ha we'll discuss those in December, but they, they represent um, elements of, of many of these goals. Okay. Do we have a motion on the goals? Move to approve the goals. Second. Okay. Uh, discussion. I just have one quick minor point on the bottom. It says district goals 2012 2013. Can we get rid of that? Mm hmm. Um, that was a little, confusing. a little mistake. Um, discussion? We went over these a lot in retreat last week. 
Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those against? Okay, carries, 7-0. Thank you, Dr. Bode. All right, you are on again. Superintendent's report. Good, well, I'm glad we, we picked up some time in these because I actually have a fairly long report. <laughs> it's good. Um, at your places tonight, you have the final report of the visiting committee for NEASC. And we're going posting that on our website and as well as distributing it with the, um, the high school staff. I do not intend that this is the meeting that we're talking about the NEAS report. Um, we, are, we are going to need to have a separate meeting, um, perhaps this summer, and certainly this isn't it's something that we're going to be discussing over probably many meetings as we go forward. But it is rather just simply to um, mention a few, go looking at the report, looking at a few of the highlights, and then you can have some time to sort of read it more, uh, more thoroughly and I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of uh, questions. And at that time, we'd certainly want to invite the high school principal and our curriculum leaders and, and also the, uh, the other administrators in the high school to come and, and be part of that discussion. So this is really a very uh, limited overview of where we are with this. Um, for those that are listening who are not, may not be familiar with what NEASC is, NEASC is an independent uh, accrediting agency. It's called the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. And they, we are a member of that association. And as part of our membership, they come and do an assessment in a number of categories uh, and with regard to the number of standards every 10 years and once that report is issued then there is also follow-up during the course of that 10 years. This represents the 10-year visit and what they found that the team visited in December. Um, there was late spring a draft report that, that you always do that it's part of the process draft report that we respond to and then an, a final report is issued. And then after that, there'll be a, a period where they will, they'll have a, a, a summary letter of their, mm -hmm. uh, their standing relative to the report. So there, in you, and when looking at the report, um, there are a number of standards. There are teaching and learning standards um, that look at core beliefs, they look at curriculum, they look at instruction. And then after that, uh, they look at resources, school culture, resources, and, and basically the community. So I thought I would just go through a couple of the highlights of these, um, looking at the overarching category of teaching and learning standards, which um, looks at um, core beliefs. And if you want to refer to this, this is on page 18 of your report that you have, at your, have, you, you have there. And how you have a, how the or report is is organized? It has a narrative, and then at the end of each one of the sections, they'll have commendations and recommendations um, that that are given. And it's going to take some time to read through this to have a sort of a, a, a get a full full understanding of it. But for example, in the commendations for this particular uh, standard, that the identification, the accommodations of this is one of many, of six of them. The identification of a set core, set of core values, which is the I care, and you've heard that mentioned here in this room before, that are embodied by the vast majority of students and staffs, and it positively impacts the culture of the school. And there are other accommodations in that line as well. Um, one of the recommendations for um, the school in that regard is to implement a plan to regularly review and update the core values, beliefs, and learning expectations. So that's the, type, the nature of that particular standard. If you turn to page 23, this is in that broad category, again, teaching and learning. This is about curriculum. And there are six commendations and five recommendations in this section, again, preceded by a narrative. But for example, a commendation is that the Arlington High School staff is committed 
to providing high quality curriculum to all of its students. And further down in another one, it says they have authentic learning opportunities through community service and the capstone project, as well as physical education and wilderness, survival and wilderness camping. A recommendation, oh, there's five of them, that they would establish additional time for collaboration and ongoing work necessary to maintain 21st century standards and curriculum. And actually some of that we're talking about with respect to calendar, how do you find that time um, to have that level of collaboration in a high school? So those are challenges that will face us. Um, when you move on to the instruction uh, section for teaching and learning, page 27, Accommodation, and you've heard a little bit about this tonight, the use of evaluations by administrators to ensure that instructional practices are consistent with the school's core values, beliefs, and 21st century learning expectations. What is part of the learning culture and teaching culture of the high school are, are consistent, common assessments to measure um, the student learning. What we're moving to is a, a different form of that, which measures sort of the yardstick of what's learned in the, in the course of one year. Um, they talk about the engagement of students as active and self-directed learners through a variety of research-based instructional techniques. And the com faculty is committed to a high quality inst instruction. Um, in recommendations, for example, in this section, they talk about ensuring that all teachers have equitable access to modern technology and appropriate training to enhance its instructional practices, hence the professional learning day, because that's an ideal time for that. But we also do a lot more with technology than that. But again, it's, it's um, as you increase technology, increase technology integration, it also really increases the need for professional development. If you turn to page 36, Again, in the teaching and learning assessment uh, uh, section, this is on assessment. One of the accommodations for assessment was that a wide variety of assessment strategies, including formative and summative assessments, um, in order to revise and improve curriculum and instruction used by teachers. So it's a commendation that this is happening. Um, a recommendation, again, to the um, time issue, provides sufficient formal time for teachers to collaborate in the creation, analysis, and revision of formative and summative assessments. So you get the sense of, if there's a, uh, in this broad category, there are, there are um, a variety of commendations and recommendations. And again, this is not meant to do an in-depth look at this, but rather to look at how it's set up and just calling people's attention to it and letting them know that they can look at this online. Now, that's the teaching and learning. If you look on page 38, this will give you an outline of what the support standards are. And there are three support standards, school culture and leadership, school resources for learning, and community resources for learning. Um, if you look now at page 45, this is on school culture. There are, there are 11 commendations and six recommendations. Mm -hmm. A commendation, for example, is the existence of a positive school culture which makes Arlington High School a safe and welcoming place for students and staff. And they also mention the impressive array of extracurricular clubs and organization. The exceptional demeanor and deportment of students in the school indicating a respectful and supportive school culture. They also comment on the, the lack of barriers to general student enrollment and core and elective courses. And the leadership and initiative demonstrated by teachers essential to the improvement of the school. In a recommendation, that they want to ensure that, that uh, research-based instructional strategies and teacher collaboration are supported by the school schedule. Again, coming back to this issue of time. And um, 
implement a way to address overcrowding in classroom se settings in which the use of lab and studio equipment presents potential safety hazards. All right, so moving on to the next support standard, resources for learning on page 52. Uh, one of the commendations on this is a, uh, the comprehensive array of academic, social, and emotional support programs and services available to assist students in meeting 21st century expectations. Um, a recommendation is to assure the availability of language appropriate materials for assessing and placing ELL students, and that's something we've talked about at, at this table as well. So again, you get the sense of there were eight, there were eight commendations and um, two recommendations in this section. Now I really want to call your attention to page 56, which is the community support uh, standard. And uh, this theme is echoed through in the commendations, recommendations. And I, I just want to read this statement. Um, Quality instruction is being delivered by teachers in spite of the impediments of a crowded and deteriorating building. Although students and teachers have pride in the programs at Arlington High School, the advanced age of the building shows significant signs of wear and tear. Science labs are not sufficient in size or design for some classes that have larger enrollments. Columns and posts in rooms obstruct student vision and movement. A little bit further down, it says classrooms are insufficient in number and size, especially in science and art classrooms, where class size exceeds the number of available stations in some classrooms. Students are able to achieve educational goals and objectives in spite of a facility with significant needs. Mm -hmm. And if you turn to page 58, um, that sentiment is echoed again in the commendations and, and, and certainly in the recommendations. In this section, it's the reverse. <laughs> we have four commendations and ten recommendations. Um, Six out of the ten deal with the building. With the building, right, right. So we, we certainly need to have a follow-up discussion at this table. There's implications for a whole array of things in terms of support and time and uh, teaching and learning, and certainly the building itself. So this is something that we will do. It's, it's going to be um, something that probably will be in many ways in our meetings over the next, over the next year, really, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of issues here, and we might want to focus on, we'll have to think about how we want to focus on this, if we want to take it by standards or a couple standards at a time, mm -hmm. uh, and do it that way. So, Mr. Right. I, I just want to say, going, you know, I, I read through this kind of stuff all the time, and I want to say that on one level, this is one of the most exemplary reports that I've seen, because when it comes to the heart and soul of teaching and learning this building, they are commending the teachers, they are commending the administration, they are commending the students, uh, and when you look at the recommendations, those are sort of the uh, excellent to exemplary kind of recommendations, the thing that will really move us to, to the very top of the field. I mean, the, they're not describing things that are wrong, they're sort of pointing us to the next steps to get better, and you could hear some of those steps being discussed earlier uh, in the measures. But on the flip side, it is highly critical of the facility that we are unable to meet the needs of our students uh, with our facility, that the teachers are really going the extra mile to provide this high quality education as that sentence you read, despite the fact that the facility that they're operating in is, is a definite drawback. And uh, reading through this, I can't imagine being accredited 10 years from now unless we have a significant uh, improvement in the facility that we're offering for our students. Mm -hmm. All right, so you need time to read it and we'll come back to it for sure. All right, um, some uh, administrative announcements. As you know, this, we have a number of retirements um, and openings in, in key administrative positions and, and or also support position. And 
One is our attendance officer and court liaison. Which, uh, we met in executive session with Ellen Digby, who has just done a phenomenal job in that role. Um, we had, in all of these cases, we had search committees, and, and, and I will have to say the quality of candidates was really impressive for all of these positions. And um, um, after a, a very thorough search, um, I have uh, offered the position to Cindy Sheridan, and uh, she has accepted that position. And Cindy has comes to us from having been one of the was was the program director for the diversion program when it first started in the Arling, in Arlington. Lucille Nicholson, who is our director of nursing, is also retiring, and this is a very a key position in the district. Um, we had two very strong uh, internal candidates, and that position has been offered and accepted to Sue Frankie, who just, by the way, received her doctorate. Oh, wow. Yeah, very impressive. And again, we, for the athletic director, we had a very, uh, again, a, uh, quite a search, and we had um, a number of really strong candidates, and that position has been offered and accepted to Melissa Lu... L Dul yeah, so the G is silent, <laughs> and the L is silence. Lou Lecky. It's spelled <laughs> D-L-U-G-O-L-E-C-K-I. And up. Uh, the press release went on. The press release went on that one already. Yeah, yeah, we won't be doing press release in the others, but I thought you would know that because they are somewhat key positions in the district. All right. Thank you. Um, today, and I want, we had our annual st staff recognition day, and I want to thank those of you that were able to come and to thank uh, Mr. Pierce for coming and giving a very, actually, uh, really lovely uh, talk, mm -hmm. uh, talking about some of the, uh, get, reading the lyrics of one of the songs in Rent, which was so appropriate to the work that they do. But we have a number of just wonderful people retiring, and um, I'll, I'll give you a copy of the program so that you can see that. But this is one of our most, uh, I should say, cherished events of the year where we recognize the people who have a milestones in the district, the 45-year, 35-year, 20-year. We also recognize that, that the people, the teachers who have made professional status this past year, because that, we feel that that is something worth celebrating. And then also this year, with Linda and I thinking this through, we, we really wanted to have a district-wide acknowledgement of the, the people who are retiring, and we did that today. Um, but one person I just want to bring up, because this is so unusual, uh, one of our staff members who did retire this year, uh, Nancy Ortwine, 45 years mm. of service in the Arlington Public Schools. That really is quite unusual. And the next person down that was retiring was Peter Rufo at 35 years. So it's a, it's... We have had people occasionally get into those 40s, and, but uh, not many. All right, and uh, also with respect to graduation, we graduated our class this year, and um, what an outstanding class. Mm -hmm. Great speeches, um, and uh, I think that you've seen the Ponder Report, and you can see where all of our students are going, and it's a very impressive array of colleges that they've been accepted into, and a more complete report will be coming out of the guidance department and talking about the percentages of first choice, second choice, that type of thing. But again, I want to thank members of the school committee for coming, because your presence really um, signifies the, the, um, the level of importance of this event. And again, thank you to Mr. Pierce for his, his speech this year. We did hear some feedback last year about sound, so we went and we hired a company to come in for sound, and while people couldn't hear last year, now they heard like three times. <laughs> and you're standing at the microphone, you could hear each word being said twice. It was a little disconcerting. So that's now we have to work on that piece of it. But it was um, it was a beautiful day, and uh, congratulations to all of our our graduates, and congratulations to the parents in this town for. Um, for, their, for supporting these students in their success. It's been our pleasure and really privilege to teach them for the years they've been here. Um, 
we had another little, um, it's not little, but a, a recognition of our music department. There is a magazine in Boston called the Bostoniano Magazine. And they, had a, they featured uh, two of our music teachers and, and our students in the Pops concert this year, which was, I have to say, rather extraordinary, where they had music that was playing to movies. It was a very high-tech kind of concert. But just a quick, they had a quick quote in there, but they really were commenting how flawlessly the students played. And that's really such a compliment to the, the, the discipline and the inspiration that our music teachers give them, as do our other teachers as well. Um, so congratulations to them. And also I wanted to acknowledge Mary Villano, who this week was given an award from the Rotary Club uh, for person of, Community Person of the Year, and uh, well-deserved. The Rotary Club, as you know, is really focused on service. And uh, there were a lot of people that were honored this year who have given extraordinary service to, to Arlington. But I, I, I believe the reason they acknowledge Mary Villano is, is the work that she has done in her years here in Arlington. She's been here for 32 years and has had many roles. But one of the things that has been true about her work in the school from day one has been her, her devotion and work toward involving students in community service and learning how to be a service in their school, um, how to learn to be parents. One of my first was having seen the dolls that the students were, were have, were, would be carrying around the, the school, um, learning to be parents and what it meant to have a child and, and not to leave the child there somewhere where you went off and did something else. And I know that Mary offered in many occasions to babysit these dolls, but it's really a, an interaction with the students, inspiring them to understand that they, to think beyond themselves and to think about how they can be of service to, uh, their, to their friends, to their school, to their community. And she was exemplified that in her years here. So that was a well-deserved honor, and um, of course, I've been getting emails about class sizes mm -hmm. already. And I know this concern. Um, I'm gonna. I will be sending to you uh, where we where we where we are at this point. But I have to tell you, while we look at the numbers rolled forward to next year, it is in state of flux. It changes all the time. You know, we get a We get five registrations one day, and then we get two the next. And it's just been going on like this now for several weeks. And so the numbers have been changing, and, but they change both ways. We have students withdrawing and coming in. But I will say, looking ahead already, we're, we're seeing class sizes as a norm in the elementary, getting in that 24, 23, 24, 25. But we do have some class sizes that are going to be 27, 28 next year. And uh, we're going to be watching these class sizes very carefully over the, the, the this summer, I know already grade three at Stratton and Thompson, we have class sizes that are at the 27, 28 in grade three. That's not to say that they will stay there. They may not, but they also may grow. And so we're gonna have to be watching that. What is of, con of concern though, with respect to that in our budget, as you know, we had two uh, reserve positions in the budget and um, we've already had to put one of those reserve positions um, at Stratton because their kindergarten, which we predicted to be no more than 50, is now 60 and growing. So that's what's happening, and uh, we'll have to just keep you apprised as, as to where we are with all of that. And the last thing is, as you came in the door, you saw all of those yellow tape around the, you're probably wondering what's going on. Maybe not, but what's going on is that we're putting cutaways in there for the, the door. This has been on the agenda for all year. It's just, it just was like, when did that come up on the, the, the list? The, the handicap accessibility with the buzzer, all of that was put in a long time ago. 
but we, we need to get cutaways there so that the, the people can come up. And what's going to happen now across from those cutaways is those thir first three places, mine's one, um, will be made into handicapped um, places. And the one down by the, the auditorium will no longer be a handicap because that's going to be the, the point of access. But that's why you, you see it there. Hmm. All right, so that's, that's my report tonight. Thank you. Um, are you ready to, to move on to the next one, the Thompson rebuild update? Well, we since the last <coughs> meeting, we really haven't had um, another meeting. Well, we, and that's not true. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. And we're still on target. And we're at the point where the last floor is being laid. That, that took a little bit longer than we thought there were going to be. But right now, the, the, the time frame is still that we're going to be substantial completion on July 12th. And at that point, uh, we'll still be punch lists. The punch list will go into August. We expect furniture to start to be delivered in July, though the first date is sometime early August. What we're trying to do is to get the school, at least for technology, set up by the time we do Tech University, mm -hmm. which is the second week of August. We really want the Thompson teachers to be in their building using the technology then. And so that's, what, that's why this uh, substantial completion date is so important, because there's other things that need to happen in order for the technology to be ready to go. So, so far, I, I haven't seen anything to the contrary since our last meeting. Jeff, did you want to add anything uh, to this? Well, we're, we're looking at dates for dedications. Ah, uh, yes, thank you very so much. People, people yeah. should say. Well, there are two dedications. One is dedication for the building itself, a ribbon cutting. And uh, we've contacted MSBA, and basically they're, they're just saying to us, well, let us know when you want to do it, and we'll have somebody there. I guess it's fair to say I have not, we've been trying to mine all the calendars everywhere to see if there's any conflict on the 15th of September, which is a Sunday. And so far, nothing. It's my wedding anniversary. Okay. <laughs> this will be a good way to hey, celebrate. Cancel it right. That's gone. So it's right there. So wedding anniversary. Wedding anniversary. We didn't want it on. It's town, day. town Day weekend, which is the next weekend, the next right. Saturday. Also. It's not usually it's that weekend, but it's not this year. And the reason why, because one of the Jewish holidays is on Saturday. Um, but also, we have the dedication of the library, mm -hmm. Bill Chase, on the 29th of September, and there's already an author that's coming, so we need that ahead. But I also think the community is going to be could hardly wait to come in and see the building, mm -hmm. and so I think. The 15th works, and so we're going to get those out. We have a, we'll have a lot to have to do with invitations and what the, what the ceremony is going to look like and inviting the community to come in and see the school and have tours. I, we, I think it'll be fabulous. Well, we're not clear on the time yet, sometime in the afternoon. We don't, it'll be in the afternoon, definitely in the afternoon, two-ish, something like that. Th th those details, it was really getting the date that was the tough That's part. A, well, and, I, and I feel even a little bit... Should I say it? Because is it definite? And I, I, I think it's like right there because I have not had any, um, mm -hmm. any pro anybody say, no, we can't do it then. Mm -hmm. So, so it'll easy? be up and running and have students and people will be oh, going yes. to class before you do the dedication. Oh, yes. The, okay. the students start back on the Tuesday after Labor Day. Okay. Just so checking. they'll have two weeks in the building. Uh, which uh, it's better. We originally thought maybe the eighth, but that's just too soon. Um, a lot of people have a chance to sort of get in the building, get a little bit settled, maybe even have some student work up. But people are really just going to wanting to come in, not so much see the student work as they really want to come in and see the building. Mm -hmm. Anything else on rebuild from the members? Yeah. Thank you very much. For that update. Um, in terms of us and needing a, a meeting perhaps in August. I don't know. We, we should talk about this before we all split apart for the summer. But given that we're going to have a new school up and running on, on right after Labor Day, we might want to schedule a meeting at the school committee in August to talk about any potential issues that might arise between now and then on the Thompson. Okay. We'll talk about that. Yeah, well, we can have a, we can have a 
a tentative one set up because the first meeting you're going to have is the 13th of September. 12th. 12th of September. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a Thursday. Right. But it would be before the um, the groundbreaking. But there'll be more communication in terms of what you know your, your role and what's going to happen, all of that. Good. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Johnson, uh, monthly financial report. <coughs> You have the um, monthly tracking reports. Um, I was able to, to delay the creation of these reports because of the date of this meeting mm -hmm. to capture the second to last payroll of the year. So we're pretty spot on <coughs> where we expect to land. Um, and we, have, we, ha we had a small amount of savings, um, roughly 250. I, I won't know until the last payroll hits next week exactly what our total savings amount out of which we're going to be able to do some year-end um, uh, technology purchasing and some curricular mm -hmm. supplies as well. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, and it may be just my interpretation as it usually is, but on page two of three. Um, the budget tracking report? Yes, I'm sorry. 83201, tuition to other schools. Yes, that is, uh, I have not yet done the journal entry to the circuit breaker account, and that's where you see the negative balance there. Well, it's not so much the negative balance. I'm looking at this, the second column. From everything else above, the second and third column usually add together, and you end up getting the fifth column. Am I correct? Right. The reason this is different is because I have elected to keep the tuition expenses in the, the in the general fund appropriation until the very last minute because I find that trying to manage how much we're spending in tuition when I have the expenses scattered out in multiple places is just inefficient. Okay. So, you know, the budget, when you look at the budget book, we budgeted about 6.2, I believe, 6.2, yeah, 6.3 for FY13. I'm sorry, the FY14 numbers have superseded it at this point um, in my brain. Um, but the amount of that that was coming out of the appropriation was the 4683677 you see in the first column. The reason the expenditures are so high is because I have both all the expenses, that's the next column, and all the encumbrances for out of district tuition still sitting here in the general fund. Now, it was always planned that the entire amount of the circuit breaker for FY12 would be used, which is, I think I just did the journal entry, 1.46. And then the, the other part of that amount would be coming out of the tuition DIN account from SPED. And that was all part of the FY13 budget. But I have elected not to have those expenses sitting in three different funding sources. Okay. I, I'm just moving them now. I, I guess, um, why are we not on that first column putting in the budgeted amount of money? Because this is the appropriation. This is just the appropriation. This, isn't, this is, does not include circuit breaker. It does not include tuition DIN. <clears throat> tuition in appears in, as part of the revolving expenditures. So I'm going to I'm going to have to be reminded almost monthly as this comes through every single time. Is this unique just to this type of an account? Well, I mean, whenever you're funding <coughs> one type of expense out of multiple funding sources, you have this inconsistency. Correct. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thielman. The uh, the revolving revenue tracking. This is on a cash basis, mm -hmm. correct? This correct. Is, okay. The, <clears throat> the one so thing that's that, as of that date. As of that date, right. So I, I noticed we had a total budget of 350 on the building rental, and we've collected 208. Have you adjusted the budget for next year? Yes, I have. Okay. I, I had lowered it. You lowered it, yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, how do we track where we are in terms of out of district Payments. We have a very extensive spreadsheet that is maintained on a student-by-student -student basis, and so I know very minutely um, what our expectations are for out-of-district tuition. We also, whenever, whenever a student is placed, we encumber the entire amount of that tuition through mm -hmm. the close of the fiscal year, and as student, changes, student placements are changed, say they leave one school and go to another, then the balance of the purchase order the, that's encumbered but not yet expended gets released and a new encumbrance is made. Now, I've made it a priority with the, um, the SPED financial manager to always get the encumbrance in for the new expense and then clean up 
you know, the POs that need to be canceled as we go along. So sometimes it appears overstated, but I would always rather have it be slightly overstated than understated. So that's, those are the two methodologies by which I keep track of out-of-district tuition. And, and I commend you. I think that you're doing a great job on this, but this is something that we need to be conversant on. So that if somebody asks, this, this is the kind of thing that people ask us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how are we doing in terms of out-of-district sped placements mm -hmm. and the expenses of that? And certainly if I en end up running into a FinCom member at the, at the uh, Stop and Shop, you know, that, 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 that's certainly... <laughs> They're always welcome to call me. Well, they, they might ask me, and uh, they'd right. sort of expect me to know the answer well, as well. Well, and the reason, the reason I leave them in the revol... Uh, the, re the reason I leave tuition in the appropriation in the main budget is because the sum of the expended fraud of district tuition and encumbered fraud of district tuition is, as of that moment, as tight as we can, our expectation for total tuition for the year. So our, but our, expe our budgeted expectation going into this year, where does that lie <laughs> compared to where we're at right now? I think we're right on in out of district tuition. We were hoping to have some savings, but as we've had placements creep up through the spring, we are right on. And, and we'll probably be over next year based on what we can anticipate, but you know we do have reserves to guard that, against that's, that. That's sort of a tracking number that probably, that if we can look to include that in a monthly report, would be a good thing for us to know. So how about another line on the summary page that just that, says that out could of work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a, a lot of these are just check, 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 things look pretty normal. But that's the one that always gives 